Kwele village in Loi Mentiar up in arms after Kenya Forest Services KFS issued them with a notice to stop cultivating in government forests in the area with immediate effect. Speaking in Meru, the residents said they had taken all the necessary measures to conserve the environment and now want the CS and other stakeholders to intervene. This is a Tugusi meeting. We are encouraging Watu Kutunza at the generation. Kwa if you are in Katabayetu, you up to date. Na Usiano wetu na Kenya Forest Service na KWS wenye tunafanya na wao umekuwa mzuri hawajawahi kuja watuambie tumefanya makosa so ningeomba tafadhali na hiyo ndio ile kitu inawalipa hakuna kitu kingine wanapata eh, kutoka kwa hii eh, eh, msitu yetu na sisi tunakuhakikishia ya kwamba tutachunga mzitu tutachunga miti the notice to stop cultivation inside government forests comes days after cabinet secretary for environment Soipan Tuya directed the eastern region conservative forests to take action against those cutting down trees in the forest. The CS spoke during a tree planting exercise in Meru on Saturday. Mimi nimekuja hapa leo na nimeshaona unaweza hata hesabu wale watu wako ndani ya msitu. Hapa loa imenti. Ta Kiago. How can that happen? Right under your nose. There is no excuse. So, mi nataka wazee tusaidiane. Na mvua inapokuja nitarudi hapa tupande miti hapo uh, loa imenti. So wale watu wako pale wachomoke haraka. The residents who depend on the forest feel the decision to kick them out of forest land is unfair since they had already prepared the land for planting season. They want at least a one year notice. Tunashanga niaji tumia 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 tuna inasemekana tunaharibu msitu tunakata miti area ile ambayo inasemekana tumekata miti eh, mkubwa tu alipitia njuu na ndege akaona community wanakata lantana kawaida ile ambayo tunafanya sasa akafikiria ni miti inakato unajua uwezi wafukuza mtu kwa msitu umwambie sasa season imekuja tumefanya kuparilia tumepanda miti tumefanya kila kitu utuambie usiingie kesho just last week 23 forest managers and rangers were sacked following a presidential directive. The 23 were found guilty of being involved in illegalities that led to destruction of forests. Clement Masombo, KTN News. Thank you, Clement, for that report as we continue having this conversation on issues to do with climate change and climate action and the voice of the youth in this entire conversation. Remember that even the voice of the youth was picked during the Africa Climate Summit that happened in the country. But was it enough? What do the youth think about it? Now in studio with me is Keith Andere, Executive Secretary, Africa Youth Commission, and Clive Donnelly, Youth Climate Policy Advisor and also a climate activist gentlemen welcome to the set right now and we just go straight from that story that we are from covering right now it, it is all about uh, people leaving the forests and uh, planting of trees now this is uh, appears to be double speak because remember the deputy president told people to go in the forest and and cut trees because yo it is an economic venture mm -hmm. is a double speak from the side of the government Thank you so much, uh, first of all, for uh, having us onto the studio. But I think this really sets the conversation that, uh, you know, it's all out here, all about climate change. What does it mean? Is climate action taking um, action to plant trees? But the big question is, who are the people who are going to plant trees? Where are we getting the seedlings from? And whose land are we going to plant the trees on? If it's my private farm, what does that then mean for sustainability of it? If it's community land, where does that tree end up? You know, Are we having community responsibility in maintaining and managing the trees? And we've also seen quite a number of times that um, you know, even government land as it stands, for example, you have some lands that is earmarked for you know, industrial use. And the time comes when government wants to set up industrial um, zones like you know the former CS for trade has been doing around the country and so they cut down the trees we've even seen around the city that you know public trees quote-unquote are cut down for a private entity to put up billboards so who ends up benefiting you know uh, and so that is some of the kind of questions that we need to also have at the onset of planting the trees mm -hmm. what is the end goal of this planting mm -hmm. trees are we just planting trees because yes we are rallying behind the president or we have a, an end goal to it mm -hmm. yeah. Clive 
Now, it is a question of the president saying that we need to plant 15 billion trees. They, what's the role of the youth in planting these 15 billion trees? Has conversation come in effect that the youth are responsible of these? Or in this entire conversation, where do the youth belong? Yes. Actually, I would like to say that, you know, uh, in all this conversation, there's a lot of all back and forth and there's no a clear synergy whereby we are positioning ourselves as young people. And there are so many young people who plant trees every day uh, within the communities, but how are these young people benefiting from these projects? It's not just about planting trees alone, but, you know, the, the, we also need to come up with a, a consolidated effort so that these young people, they also know that, you know, we cannot just plant trees everywhere because you know some trees when you plant them in climate sensitive regions it leads to maladaptation yes the call for the president to plant to plant uh, 15 billion trees uh, is a critical mechanism and a critical landmark for our country but again there's a lot of double speaking within the, the within the system uh, recently when the president said that people should go back to the forest mm -hmm. yeah and I think we need to come up with clear mechanisms and putting in place uh, clear objectives because there are so many young people who are, uh, are deviate or ob objective in, in construct ensuring the environment is secured. Mm -hmm. But is the government really working with us to ensure that security is done? Now, uh, Clive, you raised something very important. I'll come to you, uh, Keith. Now, he's talking about what trees to plant where. Mm -hmm. And it is a question of even as we are talking about uh, planting 15 billion trees, there is no roadmap on how this is going to take place. Which trees should we plant that will benefit our fight, uh, our action against climate change? Yeah. Uh, in areas where um, we have, uh, someone would argue, why would I plant an indigenous tree, yet I can do mango, uh, a mango tree? So it is a win-win situation because at the end of the day, I can sell the mangoes and get money out of it. Mm -hmm. Someone else will go like, yo, I want to plant indigenous trees because that is what does better in our area. Mm -hmm. This entire conversation is not being had. We're mm -hmm. only being told, plant 15 billion trees. Absolutely. As the youth, we know that we, we are here to spend majority of our lives, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, are we being involved in this conversation? Um, I think we are just um, the cherry on the cake, like we're just the salt on already cooked menu. So we are not in the kitchen. Uh, we are here to be served cook, uh, a menu that we did not choose, ingredients that we have no idea, mm -hmm. because it's just something that we're being told, look, uh, go all out there and plant 15 billion trees. I agree with you on um, the kind of trees that we should be planting uh, to the benefit of the people planting it. For example, um, the issue of land rights is still a very big uh, issue, not just in Kenya, like in most countries in Africa, where many people, especially children and, and women, do not have access to uh, land in terms of property rights to it. You know, People have, especially young people, have access to land, uh, use in land, interest in the land, but not only in the land. Mm -hmm. So where do I have the opportunity to even go and plant? Uh, what kind of tree, for example? Yeah. Uh, we are seeing that you know, day in, day out, the little uh, family lands that uh, we do have in Kenya are continuously being divided into smaller and smaller scale because you have two sons and you want to you know, give them a portion out of it and then each one of them has a son and they want to make sure that their little house and uh, while at it, I also need my burial place. Of course, and <laughs> have a small uh, dead capital. Eh? <laughs> but it's, it's in an African nature, you know. Atini Wachebe said that it's in, it is in a man's home that uh, weddings are planned, uh, baby naming ceremonies, and also funerals are conducted. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, it is our cultural thing to do, mm -hmm. you know. But then, when I have my quarter an acre, and he has his one acre, what are the priorities for production, you know, uh, within the land access that we do have? So you find that even with that uh, land system that we do have because of all land rights and access to land and all of this, the priority then be become more of uh, the sustainabilities of family beyond the trees. We are seeing people cutting down trees so that they can do their kitchen garden. Mm -hmm. You know, um, people are now cutting the trees so that they can continue to build their houses. So what mechanisms are we seeing that the government is providing uh, efforts towards? For example, how is the government um, supporting the seedling uh, mm -hmm. companies or people who are actually producing t uh, tree seedlings? You know, because then the triple effect is that if 
government is able to support them, making sure that they have uh, the seedlings themselves, then they can give those seedlings to the farmers, you know, uh, who are already into their farms, and they can even use those to put it around the fence, as we commonly see, you know, mm -hmm. back in our mm -hmm. villages and so on and so forth. But I think to answer your question in uh, point blank, no, we are just coming to an already cooked meal. You know, Keith, when you when you bring the question of someone cutting trees to build their house. Uh, someone would argue that the government is offering affordable housing, but that's a topic for another day. <laughs> now, <laughs> are they affordable? How affordable? <laughs> to whose end? <laughs> now, now, I'll come to you, uh, Clive. Mm -hmm. Now, in this entire conversation, we plant trees so that we are able to clean the atmosphere more. Yeah. That means having, um, ha having lowering our carbon footprint. Yeah. And with this then comes the conversation, the big word, mm. carbon credits. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a while back, I had someone on the show, and they said carbon credits, in simple terms, is giving someone else the right to continue releasing emissions and paying us to clean the environment. Mm -hmm. In this entire conversation on carbon credits, you are a carbon credits guru. Just take us through it. What exactly does carbon credit mean? Yeah, actually, uh, not going into those vague scientific terms. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We're hoping to learn. Yeah. Those big yeah. carbon, carbon credits is simply, you know, uh, it's like giving you an incentive mm -hmm. or a credit uh, for maybe a chunk of, of forest that you have somewhere. It's like paying you for your forest, uh, you're earning from it. And basically, uh, going now into other perspective, uh, we've seen that uh, just driving in from the past conference, uh, African Climate Summit, mm -hmm. There's a lot of conversation on carbon credits, and this is a convention that has been ongoing in Africa. But not so many people in Africa are conversant with how carbon credit works. But the reality is that, personally, I feel that carbon credits is a dangerous distraction for you know African position, because it's like somebody giving you a credit, uh, uh, somebody is, is polluting li the river upstream, mm -hmm. but now downstream because you're complaining of the dirty water, now they're paying you so that you know you can have, uh, it's, it's, I, I could you say it's like a bribe, yeah? exactly. so go buy water. water. And so therefore, uh, understanding, yes, the Paris Agreement uh, calls for us to acknowledge uh, the carbon credit, credit and also within the, the vast uh, climate policy and govern, climate governance system. But again, uh, in Africa, the African, African pollution emissions is negligible. Africa pollutes uh, less than, three per, less than uh, 4%, four percent, yeah. and therefore this is why I'm saying it is negligible. And therefore, the carbon credit conversation needs to be really looked into because even the rules governing the market, they do not favor the developing countries. The market is so volatile and doesn't allow even young people who are in the forestry system uh, to benefit directly to it. Uh, the reason why I'm saying the, 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 the market is volatile is because rule governing the, the market doesn't even show uh, clear synergies. For instance, there are so many intermediaries who do not show the profit margin of their carbon credit system. And you know, this money is supposed to trickle down to local communities, but this money is, you know, shrouded within the thin air. Mm. And therefore, we need to look forward into more critical conversation and analysis, bring expertise advancement in how, on how, you know, our carbon markets really should work. But personally, it is a dangerous distraction for us. Keith, yes, carbon credits. <coughs> big word. He's expounded what this conversation is, is all about when it comes to carbon credits. Mm -hmm. But now the big question is, as Africa Climate Summit uh, took place in Nairobi and came about with the Nairobi Accord, yes. in that document, what is the African policy on carbon credits? What are our rates? Or is all this conversation about carbon credits decided? outside Africa and as young people who are into this entire conversation, what should be our standard as we prepare to go to COP28? I think, um, you know, taking reflections from uh, COP27, which was uh, dubbed the, um, the African uh, COP, uh, or the COP for the African people, um, I mean, carbon credit was not some of the priorities that did come out of, um, you know, the COP27 in Sharm el uh, Two major things um, that were critical for Africans at the time, and I don't think that has changed much. Um, one was, you know, the, the funds for loss and damage mm -hmm. and uh, climate adaptation uh, funds, because really that is where 
uh, Africa aims as the most um, you know, uh, uh, volatile uh, continent in the world and the one that has really suffered because of the impact of climate change, like uh, my brother had said, that uh, the contributors have um, come from Global North and in fact 1% of the, you know, uh, the top uh, elite have contributed 50% of uh, carbon emissions, you know. So I think it's um, an oxymoron and it's like Africa is being uh, asked to tiptoe through somebody else's uh, narrative, you know. And so we are almost put in a situation where we are not really part and parcel of the menu again. Mm -hmm. um, somebody is coming and saying, look, this one is spiced up more. Uh, please come and join to it. And our leaders, unfortunately, are buying the bait. You know, everybody else is coming to talk about um, carbon credit. Where are we in terms of, um, you know, uh, climate adaptation? Ad adaptation finance, where are we in the loss and damage, the 100 billion that was committed to us? So I think if we're not starting and following through with the basics, then everything else just becomes a wild goose that we're trying to chase around. Now, yeah. you talk about 100 billion dollars, yeah? Absolutely. Not shillings, 100 billion dollars, dollars that yes. was promised at COP27. As you speak right now, we're only doing 10 billion yes. dollars. And even as we talk about 10 billion dollars and what has to be done across the world, it's just a drop in the ocean. Absolutely. But even while added, as we have this conversation uh, on uh, uh, these conferences, Africa Climate Summit, COP28, COP27, mm -hmm. they are high-level delegate meetings, heads of state, uh, policy makers, and all that. Uh, but this voice of the youth seem to be given a priority to go have that discussion at the corner. Why so? Yes, uh, I believe that young people we need to be at the seat of it. We mm -hmm. have to have a seat at the table. But yes, of course, we agree that uh, technical dialogues and negotiations, mm -hmm. they can be even more technical as sometimes beyond, you know, youthful perspective on how we will start maybe because of experience. But in today's world, youthful thinking has been advanced to a greater height and it plays a critical role in climate change mitigation as young people have very vast uh, uh, critical thinking capacity and also uh, we've been at the forefront and center on mitigation mechanisms putting leaders into account but still you find in these negotiations young people are still being neglected or left behind and this is why we need now to come up clear mechanism on how we can change the system because most of these international negotiations they are they work within the international systems an international system seems to be outdated and just and unsustainable because you cannot leave the majority of the of the population Are you out of the seat. The international system is a TBT. <laughs> 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 yeah, we yeah. will say that, but there is really critical reform that needs to be made within the international system and majorly incorporating youthful voices. And this is why we need to have now the intergenerational dialogue. The older generation, they must, you know, bequeath us to the future where we know it is resilient. And we young people, we must also keep the mantle in ensuring that the future they bequeath us is resilient and we are making it better also for even biodiversity to thrive in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, Keith, as a country, we just came from the worst drought we've experienced for about four decades. Yeah. And according to how uh, climate is changing, uh, stats start show that things are actually getting worse because it is obvious right now that there is no way we are going to stay under 1.5 degrees. Yeah. That means it will move from uh, four decades to around a century if we are not careful. Mm -hmm. And as the young people who will spend more time on the face of the earth. Mm. As these conversations start, mm. what should be our position at the table, say in the country, uh, Ministry of Youth Affairs, uh, in this ministry, in the Ministry of Environment, do we have the youth who champion the issues about the youth concerning the youth, especially in regard to matters climate change, because that is why we're here. I think um, maybe a, a better place for me to start mm -hmm. to respond to this question I'll um, talk about two things. One, uh, content, and second, process. Um, many people, especially the young people, uh, are always dragged to the room uh, as a majority to fill up the empty mm -hmm. spaces. So it's not deliberate that, you know, um, at any given table, would want to make sure that it is a youthful uh, kind of a table. Because when you look at the statistics, you know, they say the medium age of uh, an average Kenyan is about 19, 19 years, yes. right? But the median um, CS 
you know, is about 45, 47, 48. But what can we learn from other countries? Um, looking at countries like Rwanda, for example, uh, looking like countries like Namibia, for example, they've strategically ensured that um, young people not only have the content, um, you know, they're now educated, they're now exposed, we are taking advantage of, um, you know, digital technologies to even improve uh, our upskilling. We've seen since COVID that many people actually took, you know, uh, other courses because they had the time, they had, you know, uh, the ability to even get the certification from um, the comfort of their homes. So now being part of the process, having had content, how do you get plugged in into that, um, you know, uh, process? whether or not is a um, policy generation um, or policy influencing aspect within the Ministry of um, Environment. Um, you could also flip it and want to think, have we seen consistently maybe the last three, four regimes, uh, where have they placed the Ministry of Youth? You will find that not just even in Kenya, you know, but um, quite a number of uh, African countries, um, the youth again as a ministry is uh, an afterthought. So we'll say, hmm, where do we place it? Maybe we put it in sports and culture. Ah, no, 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 no. In fact, it's not working tight with gender. You know, you move it from gender on sports. So there's no perpetuity in terms of ensuring that, first of all, even the vehicle that gets us to the Ministry of Youth, for example, as the National Youth Council, you know, we are equipping it. The National Youth Council was a vision of the African Youth Charter, which again in the long run speaks to, you know, the Africa agenda that we want, Agenda 2063. So if we are not institutionalizing um, youth engagement, then what therefore that means is consistently we will have chunks of people who come because they've understood the content, they are going to be part of a process for such a short period of time. Um, because, you know, youth is not uh, a permanent state. You know, in the next five years, uh, very unfortunately, we you will not be sitting here <laughs> <laughs> speaking on their behalf mm -hmm. because we will have crossed the mark. You know, so that again comes back to knowledge management and knowledge transfer. So even as we want to come and sit into the table, do we have the ability to use the fork and knife mm -hmm. to dine? Maybe perhaps that's where we really need to go back to the basics and look at the content, be very deliberate and ensuring that even some of these, um, you know, climate change um, conversation, mm -hmm. awareness, are even embedded in school curriculum, mm -hmm. you know? We've just taken some huge amount of time and resource uh, looking at the curriculum review, the CBC yeah. and so on and so forth. Where is technology and climate conversations mm -hmm. into this learning because we must begin from the bottom. <laughs> Keith, let's take a short commercial break when we come back and continue with this conversation because issues to do with the youth and climate change are Siamese twins. They have to sit at the table and have this discussion. We'll take a short commercial break. We will be back with much more.